guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to today's video where I thought I'd react to you and voice my opinion about some unpopular rat opinions. So I asked you to send me unpopular opinions on Instagram, whether it's your personal opinion or just opinions you've seen floating around the internet for me to react to you and give you my opinion, I guess. And I got some interesting and quite controversial one sent in, so I'm really excited to probably read them and go through them. Of course, these are just my personal opinions. If your opinions don't reflect or match mine, that's perfectly fine because we're all entitled to our own opinion, but I just thought it'd be a fun video that I could answer some of your questions because I always get asked my opinions on taking rats outside or hairless rats, and it's just an easy way to answer a bunch of those in a video. So jumping straight in, the first one is, it's fine to interact with baby rats as soon as you get them, you don't need to let them settle in. So this one I agree with for the most part, I do think it very much depends on the individual rats and their background. If they're from a good rescue or a good ethical breeder that has socialised them, then by all means touch them, handle them, give them treats in the first 24 48 hours of having them, I don't think there's any golden rule to stick to or like a golden timeline of when it's best to interact with them. I do think you have to judge each individual rat and their personalities and their behaviours and their backgrounds. Rats that are possibly rescues or pets to rats, that as soon as you put them in the cage they're hiding and cowering and not even remotely curious about you. I probably would give them at least a day to decompress before trying to pick them up and handle them and scare them even further but I do think most rats from good backgrounds and situations if they're coming up to the bars or at least sniffing your hands then by all means try to interact with them and handle them because if they're responsive to that it's probably going to be okay and you don't have to stick to any one day two day rule with that. The next one is that homemade rat cages are better than store-bought cages and I would have to disagree for the most part just because I've not actually seen that many homemade rat cages on like forums or groups that I'm in that have actually been done properly. I do think if you are going to invest the time to do this, it probably will cost you more than a store-bought cage or more than a second-hand store-bought pet store cage if you are going to do this properly and give them enough space and ventilation on all sides. The mistake I see most people making on forums and groups I'm in is they will take a piece of furniture, say for example, a wardrobe that is very, very tall, which is great, um, and then just mesh out the front, either take out like the doors or the panels, and just slap a bit of mesh on the front, and then call it a rat cage. But this is not really good. Most wardrobes or like display cases are very tall for climbing, but rats also need sufficient base cage space, and most furniture doesn't offer that, so, if you are going to convert furniture into a rat cage, please make sure it's going to be big enough on the bottom. So I don't necessarily think that homemade cages are better than store-bought cages. I do think if you are going to do it properly, it is probably going to cost you more than the price of a second-hand store-bought cage or even a full price one. So if it's done correctly, then I think it's great, but I've just not seen that many examples of properly made homemade cages for rats. The next one might rattle a few cages, and that is that rats don't need to be free roamed every single day, it's okay to miss a few days. Now if you had asked me this a few years ago, I probably would have said yes, rats need to be free roamed every single day, I probably said it in a video somewhere at some point because that is very much what I was told and I believed in based on things I saw on forums and research, the rats need at least like an hour to, some people even say up to six hours a day outside of the cage for free roam. I think if you can offer that, that is great, but for most people that work nine to five or have chronic illnesses, that's not always a reality. Now, I'm sure every single one of us has missed at least one day of free roam with the rats, whether you were sick or unexpectedly out of the house until midnight. I'm sure we've all done at least one day where we've not free roamed the rats, and that's okay. I'm sure there's been one day where you have been so sick in bed where you've not been able to get up and do much more than feeding them, watering them and giving them a few treats and that is okay. For some people that is their reality a lot more often than other people. Some days are better than other days and some days people just can't free roam their rats. Now, does that mean they shouldn't have rats or they shouldn't be owning rats? I don't personally think so. I do think that the most important thing with the rats is their cage environment, making sure it's big enough, making sure it's packed full of enrichment. 
If you're not doing that, then yes, I agree that rats in smaller cages, so for example, rats living in like fur plus for rats with not very much enrichment, yes, they should be free roamed because they can't move around too much in their cages and they've possibly not got a lot of things to do in the cage, then those rats, yes, probably should be free roamed every single day. But if you have a very large enriching cage with substrate to dig in, then I don't think missing a few days or missing a day here and there is gonna hurt them too much. If you think about a rat sleeping and waking hours, rats are crepuscular, they're awake during dawn and dusk, and unless you're a vampire or very nocturnal, you're probably not gonna be awake when they feel the most awake. And that's why I always recommend having a very active enriching cage with foraging toys and substrate because their most waking active hours you're probably not going to be there and it's really important they have things to do when you're not there things like foraging toys treats hidden around the cage things like that are the most important thing to me anyway that's not to say i don't think rats do deserve outside of the cage time i do think it's really important for them to stretch their legs and run around interact with you interact with other toys they've not got inside of the cage i do think that is really important and i don't really see the point in having rats if you're not going to enjoy them to the fullest but if you're missing a few days, please don't beat yourself up about it too much. I don't think it's the end of the world if they still have a very big, active, enriching cage with substrate, they've got each other for company. It's not the end of the world if you miss a few days here and there. Next up is hairless rats and Manx rats are the pugs of the rat world. I feel like the pug people and the hairless rat people are gonna unite together and end me in my sleep. Having only fleece bedding is not okay, they need loose bedding to dig and forage. Yes, I agree with this, I think I've made it pretty clear over the years where I stand when it comes to fleece. I don't mind using fleece sometimes on the shelves and things, but I just think if you're going to use fleece through rats, please at least give them a dig box. I'll meet you in the middle here and say that if you are going to use fleece, that is completely fine, that's up to you, but please allow them to exhibit their natural behaviours, giving them either cardboard or cocoa fibre in a box in the cage at all times to dig and forage. I think it's really important to express their natural behaviours and I don't want people taking that away from their rats just for the convenience of using fleece. So I'm not the biggest fan of fleece. I think I've made that pretty clear, but I don't mind people using it if they are gonna give them an alternative to dig and forage in. Next up is rats' lives are so short they deserve all of the treats. I would say I'm like 50-50 on this. I do think everything, of course, in moderation because if you're giving your rats so many treats on a daily basis that it's causing obesity, that can come with its own health issues that's going to shorten their already very short lifespan. So all treats should be given in moderation. If you're giving them so many treats that's causing them to be fat, then I don't think that's the best. But then on the flip side, I do think when it comes to end of life care, when you know they're not going to be with you much longer, honestly, it really doesn't matter what you put into them because they're not going to be here for much longer anyway and some things are just easier to get them to eat if they're not eating their regular food honestly their diet goes out the window and i just give them whatever i can get them to eat and i've had so many comments of people on like my rat's second birthday videos or videos where my rats are very close to death or euthanasia where i'm spoiling them giving them things like chocolate drops or giving them small pieces of cupcakes and people like flip the lid and get really annoyed that I'm spoiling the rats and giving them unhealthy food but sometimes they've got hours left or weeks left and giving them something as a treat obviously that's not their main food source but to me they're not going to live much longer anyway things like that are not going to hurt so I'm fairly 50-50 on that one the next opinion is it's fine to just keep two rats and get another one when one dies I disagree with this a lot just because I've experienced this and I really don't recommend anyone doing this because it's not always going to work out how you plan. So let's say for example you have a pair of rats and one of them dies three days before Christmas. You're then left scrambling trying to find new rats. And most ethical breeders don't tend to breed towards Christmas time or they don't home out towards Christmas time because they don't want their rats going as Christmas presents. Pet stores like Pets at Home, they also stop selling animals in like seasonal holiday periods and there's no guarantee any local rescue is going to have rats available right the second that you need them. So that is going to leave you with a lone rat with no guarantee of when you're going to get the next rats 
and that's really not an ideal situation for the rat. It's going to be very stressful, very depressing. It's going to be a lot harder to introduce them the longer you leave that rat by itself. So that's why I really recommend being proactive, planning ahead, making sure you've got rats as a backup just in case yours do start to pass away and you're not left with a lone rat. Some rat breeders, their wait list is six months to a year. There's no guarantee when you contact them, they're gonna have babies available. Some breeders will prioritize you if you tell them you have a lone rat, but again, there's no guarantee you may have to get on a waiting list and you just can't leave that lone rat by itself for six months to a year. So please plan ahead, it's in the best interest of the rats to make sure you do everything you can to make sure you're not left with one by itself. The next one is, citrus fruits aren't actually half as bad as people say they are if you look at the science. Yes, I was actually reading this study the other day. Uh, most people tend to advise you, and I've probably been one of those people, that you can't give male rats citrus, so oranges, lemons, other things that contain citrus, in any amount and just to avoid it if possible. But when you actually read the study, it will take a lot of citrus to actually be harmful, more than a rat could probably consume in one day. So I wouldn't worry about citrus too much, as much as people tend to lead you to believe because it will take a lot to actually be harmful. So if you're looking at baby food and it has like 1% lemon juice, I wouldn't worry too much. I do tend to avoid them just because of habit of being told not to give male rats citrus, but I will leave that study in the description because I was reading that the other day and it's very interesting. The next one is a touchy one and that is people who start GoFundMe's for vet bills shouldn't have gotten rats in the first place. This one, again, I'm really 50-50. I do think it does depend on the situation. At the end of the day, if an animal needs vet care, it's not that animal's fault that the person can't afford this. If it needs the care, it needs the care and the treatment. And uh, People can donate to whatever GoFundMe or fundraiser they want to. If they feel like it's a worthy cause to donate to, then it's there, no one's really forcing them to donate to this. But there's again unexpected situations that people haven't budgeted for or haven't expected. Things like accidents, freak accidents, or very rare illnesses that cost a lot for treatment. Those things I think GoFundMe's can be really valuable because everyone can come together and support an animal that has no choice in the situation and the owners really were not expecting this. Where I start to feel a bit iffy about the whole situation is GoFundMe's that are for really common things that if you'd researched before getting rats, you would know to budget for and know that rats get. I know people still come across unexpected situations like job losses and things, but there's so many GoFundMe's out there for simple respiratory infections or tumours. And at the end of the day, if people want to donate to them, they can, but you get people really pushing these in every single comment, spamming your comments, spamming your messages. And it just makes me feel a bit iffy because we all have rats, we all have our own vet bills to pay for. And obviously people can donate if they want to, but these things you should really be budgeting for before you get rats just to make sure if an emergency does crop up or your rats do need treatment for respiratory infections then you have a bit of money set aside for this. I have seen some really quite disturbing GoFundMe's with pictures of rats that have massive, massive tumours that are almost the same size of them and they look sore and painful and are close to rupturing or some of them have already ruptured and they're waiting to get enough donations to afford surgery or even simple vet care and I just think in that situation either surrendering them to a rescue or just having them euthanized is probably the kindest option rather than waiting for strangers on the internet to fund this you have no idea when you're going to reach the goal amount and that rat is sitting there probably very uncomfortable and in pain so those kind of GoFundMe's do make me a bit uncomfortable um, I get that emergencies happen, those ones I don't mind supporting, but I just think making sure you have enough money set aside for vet bills before you get any pet is a really good idea. Obviously things can change, you can lose your job, things like that, but some of them are quite alarming to see and those make me quite uncomfortable. The next one is the carry method for introductions is cruel and too stressful for the rats. So this one I of course am going to have to disagree with because it is the method that I use and I wouldn't use it if I disagreed with it, but I don't think it's cool. I do see why you may think that from an outsider point of view. If you don't use the method or you're not familiar with rats, it can look a bit questionable to people that are not used to using it. But there is method in the madness. This method is used by experienced breeders, experienced owners, vets that have rats, and all of these people would not use this. I think it's the most common method in the UK. Not all of us would use this if we thought it was cruel or it didn't work. The entire point of the carry method is to reduce the length of time the rats are in distress 
other methods that are here and there introductions can be a lot more stressful for a longer period of time and the carry method is relatively quick compared to other methods anyway and it's also supposed to be a lot safer because the rats don't have as much space to run if they are fighting and cause more severe injuries so I can see why people may think it's cruel because of the stressful introductions and also with the keeping them in the carriers overnight for a few days and also keeping them in smaller cages but to the rats that's a week out of their life they have to live in a small bare cage to live harmoniously as a group compared to longer introductions a week out of their life is not very long in comparison to the many many weeks and months and years they'll have living together as a group in hopefully a very enriching cage so it's kind of the lesser of two evils you kind of have to be a bit cruel to be kind but it is in the rat's best interest and then last but not least is kids should not be allowed rats or any pets 13 or under I do agree with this somewhat I do think rats make amazing pets for children among other pets like hamsters and mice Rats are a lot more sturdy and personable, so I do think they can make amazing pets for children, but I don't think children should be the sole owner of rats. I do think that should be accompanied by an adult because legally you do have to be 18 to purchase a pet and be responsible for them. As an adult, you are going to be responsible for vet bills, and I get far too many messages off of children saying their parents won't get them a second rat and they don't understand that rats are social and they won't take their rats to the vets, so I don't think kids should own rats for that reason just by themselves. I do think they should have parents that are on board and willing to take on the care if they get bored or take on the care if they need to, like take them to the vets and things. Again, there is the social side to rats that I do struggle with. I get so many comments and DMs of really distressed kids that have had a pair of rats and one has passed away and the parents are refusing to get any more company for that rat and the kids just can't do anything about it. So I do think kids should be allowed rats and pets in general as long as the parents are on board and they're willing to provide that social company for as long as they may need it or rehome the rats. And I've had kids tell me that parents are refusing to even rehome them which is just crazy to me. So I do think that side of it is very tricky and if you're getting rats when you're 15, 16, you have to obviously keep them as a rolling group unless you rehome them and kids are going to grow up, they're going to go to college and university where they're not really allowed to have pets. I did, but I wasn't allowed. But you're not really allowed to have pets or take them with you and you have to keep that social side going. So some people get rats thinking, I'll just have the two and then they'll die and I'll move on to the next pet. But rats are a long-term social commitment and a lot of people don't realise that. So the social side I really struggle with and I don't think makes them the best pet for kids because parents are not always on board and that can cause a lot of problems. So that is all of the unpopular opinions I'm going to address in today's video. I'm sure there's many, many more that I could talk about in a part two, or I could also do a mouse version. Let me know in the comments if that would interest you. And of course, feel free to leave your opinions about any of these topics in the comments below. Keep it friendly, keep it kind, but let's have a discussion. I hope you guys have enjoyed watching this. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!